I do think, you know, he's playing thematically with a lot of interesting real world things that you'll see happen. And the whole idea of this, like, you know, the people in the past are the ones who who created this system and they were fucking assholes. They're terrible. And yet I'm going to continue to perpetuate this system. That's saying something about world politics in general, right? Welcome, friends, to episode 322 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm writer Luke Elliott. And I'm filmmaker James Bailey. And this week we discuss the second half of Hugh Howey's 2011 novel, Wool. And stay tuned to the end of this episode because we're going to make our comparison and uh, vote on which we preferred, whether we preferred Wool or season one of Silo. Uh, So stick around for the end for that. But um, welcome back, James. Uh, Unexpected absence last week. We ended up having to skip an episode, um, but but you're back now. Yeah, bit of a family emergency. Uh, Don't want to go into too much detail just because it's not my medical emergency of someone else in my family's. But uh, for the time being, things have stabilized. Uh, it was definitely a bit scary, but uh, we're working through it. We're back here, and we're going to get back to our silo coverage. Yeah, and I was glad to hear that. Holding out uh, hope that everything continues to progress positively. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, and, and we're glad to have you back and glad to be back. Um, we ended up, uh, we had like a, a, a break kind of scheduled later in the month, and we're moving it around. So everything's going to be going to be fine. We're still going to get to our next quarterly project, um, which we can announce at the end of the episode. Um, excited about that one, too. Um, so stay tuned for that. But um, yeah, our, our business we have left with Silo is we had never finished the book. Um, we've read the first half of the book and you you warned me, hey, this gets up to the end of season one. And I'm glad you did because the rest of the book goes well beyond season one of the show. Yeah. And I talked about this multiple times is like I, I've just been waiting since watching season one of Silo for answers, knowing what goes on beyond. I originally watched the show read the first half of the book, had that surprise that it was the entire first season of the show. Then we watched the second half of the show, and now we're back to to, with all the, like, I would say a lot of answers that I've been looking for. And I'm curious to see if season two, which is upcoming, will definitely fall in line with a lot of the stuff that happens. Because we did realize the way that events kind of play out in the show versus in this first book, um, maybe out of order a little bit, very similar. But uh, there are some differences that we're going to highlight here. Yeah, I did want to just go ahead and give a warning, if it's not clear, that uh, what we're going to discuss today is the second half of this book, and it's going to probably spoil some stuff for season two. Now, from what we've seen, the show is making some big changes, and I expect a lot of what happens here will be changed, will be reimagined, remixed. Um, but I think, uh, it's unavoidable that if you're really wanting to preserve season two, you might get a little bit of spoilers for some of the big reveals that might happen. So be aware of that. If you're not a book reader that you could be getting into territory like that. Add this to your watch, watch later, uh, playlist (laughs) on YouTube or something like that. After season two comes out, come back around. Yeah. See how, see how different it is. Uh, cause what we're going to talk about, there's, there's been a lot of differences so far and, and I think there's going to be a lot more going forward. Um, and we're going to get into all of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, one thing that we didn't touch on super elaborately in our original wool coverage is that the this book was released as five individual stories um, or like kind of novels, novelettes, something like that. Like, they're, they vary in length, but they're, it's broken up into five parts. And because of that, I think it gives this book a different sort of feel than what you typically get from... Um, a sci-fi novel you know, in a more standard format. And, it, and um, I think for better and worse, at, at times it, um, it, it did feel a bit disjointed um, and there's a lot of characters. But part of that's because it's kind of five separate stories that are, interlo- that are you know, interlocked. But like, um, I, I know some people, I was reading through some of the Goodreads reviews, <laughs> um, some people didn't like that, you know, and, and I think uh, got a little bit like it was too many different characters. We didn't spend enough time with them. So I, I can get some of the criticisms I was seeing out there. Um, and I share some of them, which I'll, I'll go through th- throughout. Um, I still really enjoyed this book overall, if we want to talk generally. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I it feels a little bit like strange, kind of cobbled together out of a series of, of, of shorter stories to make it into a book. Um and it suffers a little bit for that. 
I almost take the five parts and, and the way that this was released as its own kind of unique situation because we, we learned through his, he was kind of self-publishing and as, as they got popular enough, they started to be published in, in different areas. But the, the way that like each one does have a beginning, middle and end within its own self-contained story and then they are connecting together. I do think that the later ones tend to connect together a little more than yeah, the early ones. This, yeah, the but, parts four and yeah. five were a little more connected to the to the main stories. Yeah. But I, I also liked how like parts one and two really set up and really into three set up. OK, you're informing what's going to happen with this Juliet character who's so important to us. I think parts like four and five tend to be about her and then in yeah, and out of mostly what's about going on her, her. But we but... get a lot of Lucas. Mm -hmm. um, we get um, some different characters over on the, uh, you know, the the, the rebellion side, uh, Walker. And um, mm -hmm. what's the name of the, the character who's talking to Walker a lot? Shirley. Surely, yeah. So yeah. we get surely some, but I mean, and this, I, I think this does lead to some of the feeling where like, cause like surely I never really felt like I got a great sense of as a character. It was like, she yeah, was I, there I to bounce mm -hmm. off a walker and to show us what's going on. But some of these characters we get such a brief amount of time with, and we don't really get to explore them. Um, they're kind of, you know, one-offs and like, he's good at doing it, but, um, I, I wouldn't say masterful, at least at this point in his career. Um, there are some authors uh, who I think really shine in this sort of big cast scenario. Like, honestly, George R. R. Martin is somebody who does this brilliantly, um, where you'll read these little one-off characters, and you can't. I can never like. I'm, I'm I'm always stunned by just how vivid and real even these little like single chapter characters will feel to me. Yeah. It is interesting, though, because like I said, the, the unique way that this was released is like maybe he was writing it, then releasing, writing and releasing and having to like piece it all together as it went. And if you think it would be of an them, interesting th quite question for him, to, I'm sure he's talked about this elsewhere. But um, yeah, I would be I would be curious to hear him talk about what this actually looked like. Um, and, then, and then the next. So I was also looking into it. And the next books were were um, kind of similar in that they're like multiple books put together. So it's like weird when you read about it. Um, Sometimes people call this books one through five, like oh. this wool. The next book in the series is Shift, but that's actually a collection of three smaller books. And then uh, the final one is Dust, which is, again, a collection of multiple uh, stories, right? So I think he ended up releasing the whole series this way and then has sort of, like, after the fact, started grouping them together. Um, and from what I was reading, I won't spoil anything, but, like, the next major book... Um, shift is actually a prequel, so it goes back oh, in time to to events that occurred before the events of what wild. we just read. Yeah, and that's kind of interesting. And then Dust, when he comes back for this final part, that's where we're actually moving forward from the events of Wool. Yeah. And I can see how we talked about on the show they're going to pull stuff from all kinds of different books, and that totally makes sense when you have a chronology that's going to be that. And you're and I'm sure if you're backfilling a lot of the history of this world. Um, and you're starting out with the full knowledge of the entire series, you're going to start threading things in earlier and you're going to lean on that to develop. Um, I, and I saw a lot of that in the show. And I think that honestly, it's really cool. And it, I think that's the smartest way to adapt this. Um, after reading even just this enough of this part, I'm like, I don't think this would have worked as a movie. Um, it would have had to have been unrecognizable. Um, whereas doing a show, I think has been really smart. And one of the things, you know, you're able to do then is like shore up, any potential areas that kind of need more more attention, and I think that's character. Um, it, as as much as I like the characters, we we kind of fly through them so fast that it's nice to spend more time with them and and really get to know their motivations. I'm curious though, like if you if you took these on an individual basis, because obviously if you take five separate books and put them together and say this is one book, it's gonna feel weird just structurally and pacing yeah. and a bunch of things are gonna feel weird. But if you were to like break them down into individual stories, does that make you feel differently about it instead of referring to this as like its own one single book? I, I'm um, I'm on the fence because I would say that uh, early on they were very strong individual stories, but I think in particular four and five feel like kind of the same. Like I, I find it difficult to even like find out where that separation was. Like I don't even remember honestly, um, because that whole all felt like one story, and and honestly, kind of it's all kind of a continuation of part three. So yeah, it's it's kind of a mix.
it's almost like parts one and two led to part three, which should have been three, four, and five as one kind That's of. That's kind of its own book. Yeah. But then, yeah, he, I feel like there was there were some decisions made to make them kind of s- stay separate in a way. But I mean, this is all very nitty gritty stuff. Um, that like I don't know how much the average reader cares about this. It's just interesting from a structural point of view to like f- try and figure out why the story is structured in the way it is. Um, which is kind of kind of a strange way, I think. Yeah. Like I said, I, I think I kind of appreciate it for the uniqueness of it. And I, I didn't think of it. I guess if I was forced to think of it as one book, it does feel weird. But for some reason, something about it left me where like each time I would hit the end of a part, I'd be like, wow, that was a cool kind of final finality to that that sort of arc that was going on moving into the next one. Now, I do agree four and five especially felt like they could have just been one. But uh, something about it was yeah. was kind of doesn't really kind of matter. <laughs> nice. right? and, 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 and it made me think about like the way that the story was released and thinking about like if you were following along as it was released, waiting for that next part, how exciting that would be. And, and maybe that's sort of why I'm appreciating. Yeah. And he built a lot of popularity and a lot of um, momentum releasing it the way he did. So I'm sure he has no regrets about it. And honestly, it led to the success that that, it, you know, he experienced. So um, but I, yeah, I want to know. So like. uh how did you feel about the second half of this book? And like, how does it make you feel about it on the whole as, as a piece of media? Um, now that you've seen the show, um, is this something where you're like, people really should go read the book or is it like, yeah, the book is an optional thing. Like, how do you feel about it? I I do tend to feel like it's, it's uh, a little more optional because I, and I'll get to this, I think as we get to our, our deliberation, but Mm -hmm. I, we, we talked about how this is Howie's chance because he's so involved with the show to sort of re-evaluate the show and restructure it in a, in a, in a sense and, and having written all He's of it and know the He's involved in the writer's world. room. If you didn't listen yeah. to our last one, like he he is like very for hands the show. on the show. Yeah. Right. So, so knowing that makes me feel like the way that this is as his own media, piece of media, um, kind of makes me feel like I want more and I keep wanting more and the world, there's so much more to explore in the world. I think that this, this like parts four and five did something cool where... It, it is progressing farther than anything I was aware of up to this point. And it got a lot of stuff that I wanted to see done, but it does kind of come to that final moment very quickly. And it felt like I, I wanted to like, it felt like there was larger conflicts at play. Um, and I, I know that was probably intentional, but it felt like uh, we raced to the end there at the end of part five. Um, and I kind of wanted to see that expanded. Yeah, I, I agree. So I think uh, the watch covering this the way we did I think did create a bit of this um, issue, but I agree because um, the show just proceeds at a much slower pace. And so when we came back to the book, the faster pace was, was a pretty dramatic shift. And to, to go from this like a uh, little bit more deliberate uh, and just sort of fleshed out feel of the show to all of a sudden we're flying through events. Everything that happens with the rebellion in silo 18 just flew by it was so it fast felt like, that felt like it could have been a, it's an entire its own book entirely yeah. like a yeah. sequel and we novel. were getting like pieces of it often and not even like really getting the whole thing and like man that flew flew by so like certain things felt like they were just at breakneck pace but if we had only been reading this book it probably would have been more in line um this is yeah. probably a, a a pacing issue somewhat caused by the way we ended up reading it I think I think that's probably right. And also just that like Hugh Howie, I think, wanted to put an ending on this story um, that would be satisfying for people, but also leave so much room to explore. Like like I said, that that all the battling and the uprising felt like it could have been its own five part series. And then we get like the sort of restructuring that happens at the end of the story here, uh, at, at, like at the very, very end happens in like two chapters. And all of that feels like a lot of world building and stuff that, that I would have liked to see, the, the like see how the world plays out now that other events have kind of changed the landscape of the silo. And then obviously that's leaving so much room for sequel material. So so he it was all intentional. It just felt like to me as as this is its own self-contained kind of five part one book series, one book story here it just felt really quick and and it felt like the ending kind of tied it up really nicely in a bow very quickly yeah so let's get into some of the plot and we can talk about specifics that happen um i'm going to read this in just two chunks so last we left juliet she had been sent out to clean um and you know kind of the shocking end of part three 
which ends up being the end of season one. So Juliet explores her surroundings and learns that there are other silos in the area. She makes her way into one of them and sets up with one man who survived the fighting in the silo. He teaches her how to communicate with the other silos, and she begins talking to Lucas, a man whom she'd known before she was sent out for cleaning. Uh, Lucas is being trained as Bernard's backup. Juliet finds a way to return to the silo so she can take revenge against Bernard. Meanwhile, people of Supply and Mechanical have launched an uprising against Bernard and IT. Lucas is locked in a secret compartment of IT in an attempt to keep him safe. Okay, so a lot a lot to cover there. Um, first off, she's sent out to clean, um, and she ends up stumbling basically into another silo um, because her, her stuff starts to fail, and she starts to realize she needs to get um, to safety, even though it, her suit is much better than anybody else has ever been sent out. Um, and as we suggested and, and predicted in our, our, our previous episode, she's going to go into one of these other silos. She does. Sure enough, it's another silo that has had a past um, rebellion of some sort or some sort of um, tra- you know traumatic event happened. A bunch of people had gotten out and then tried to get back in. So she's like climbing over bodies. Gruesome. All these people. Uh, very gruesome. Moments kinda, of kinda, like yeah. stepping on bodies. And she's like, re- re- I mean, just it's grotesque, but it's also like evocative uh, yeah. of like how, how wild that situation would be. If- so that actually reminded me of the scene in The Stand uh, where Larry Underwood is is going through that tunnel and like climbing over all these bodies and uh, just how like harrowing that was um, this, you know, this is, this is pretty different, but um, it just, I don't know. It evoked that scene a little bit for me. Um, I, I love this part. And yeah, you know, her finding her way in and she has to like kind of break into this silo and then the like eeriness of it and the quiet she encounters when she gets inside. And it seems like the entire place is empty. A few things that I liked about this is uh, she's getting to use her mechanical know-how often which is yeah. really cool, like in, in order to break in and all these ways that she's thinking about it as like a stuck nut, the doorway, and she's able to pry her way in. Um, and then when she gets inside, I loved the the kind of internal nature of how she was already starting to think like, am I going, am I, ta- am I going to be the kind of person that's going to start talking to myself? Am I going to go crazy by myself in the silo very quickly? And then the timer, which again, this, this story, this, this series loves to play with timers of her not not knowing if she can breathe within the silo. So she's yeah. kind of stumbling her way through everything. And she's like, cover. she pours soup all over herself. And yeah, the soup thing she, is interesting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she she uh, it finally is just at the point where she has to pull the mask off. And she does. And she's able to breathe and starts yeah. to realize that some of the life support service, like uh, things are still up in the silo. One thing that this part also uh, gets into is these flashback sequences where... Um, we find out Juliet attended these Shakespeare plays and she met like the actor who played Juliet. And it was like this for, you know, foundational memory for her. We start getting, we start getting these Shakespeare quotes at the start of a lot of chapters. Um, and, and, you know, he kind of starts integrating some Shakespearean stuff, um, which was okay. Um, I, I don't know that I... I think maybe just because I've been spoiled by Station Eleven, um, that that did post-apocalyptic Shakespearean stuff way better. Um, I was I was a, a little bit less charmed with this 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 particular version of that. I, I mean, it, to compare it to Station Eleven is is you know a tough a tough bar to 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 cross, obviously. But also, I I liked because be, it, often the quotes were tying into what was going to happen in the chapter in, in a in a way which I thought was kind of fun and and pretty clever. Um, Juliet, obviously being named after Juliet from Romeo and Juliet, and then yeah. and then no. Although it's that- interesting too because it was Romeus. So so yeah. he did. He, there was like some small changes had been made to the story. It seemed like yeah. I wonder if that was obviously by the the powers that be that kind of wanted to control. Yeah, or just narrative. over time because we find out that it's been it has been a few hundred years. Yeah, confirmed. Which I was always skeptical of, but yeah. that's confirmed. Yeah. But to know because we didn't see any. Uh, it didn't feel like at least scenario in the silo where people were putting on plays or there was like yeah. these, these huge art movements and stuff. So I thought it was cool to also tie that into this story in this world. Yeah. And um, in general, I, it also seems to me that some of the restrictions that we see in the show um, aren't as stringent in the book. Um, for, for example, they, um, they appear to be able to have a little bit more magnification than I thought was legal in the show. 
Um, they there is more of these antiques around. They don't seem to be as tightly regulated as they were in the show. So there's some things that I, I think smartly when they were when they were fully imagining and realizing this this world for the show, they they thought like, oh, you know, it would make a lot of sense for them to do. And they started implementing more of that. So it's it's one of those scenarios where it's like, yeah, you take a, you had a second crack at it as Hugh Howie and you had other people to, to, that you were bouncing ideas off of. And it seems like you you added a little more. And I'm also just curious if like the relic stuff, if that's something that he he an idea, because as you work in a world and you just continue to toil away at it, I feel like you come up with great ideas. Oh, and you're like, oh, I wish I thought of this sooner. Absolutely. And it's cool to think that like it's possible. We don't know. If that somewhere down the line he comes up with this and he's like, oh, that would be really oppressive if the relics and all this other, maybe in the prequel series in the prequel book. Yeah, maybe maybe they used to be more illegal and he decided and he decided to bring that up into the into the current day. Um, yeah, that would be interesting because the relics are, are really fascinating in this in the show. So it's, uh, you know, definitely a cool element that was added. Yeah. So uh, we, we spend a lot more time with Lucas. Um, he's he is sort of pining after Ju- uh, Juliet here. After uh, she's been out to, to clean. Yeah, and at yeah. first he thinks she's got, she's dead, and then he finds out that she didn't die and that she actually crossed the hill. And then an interesting dynamic plays out where Bernard chooses Lucas to be his shadow. Um, and Lucas kind of goes along with it, but then we know he's secretly having you know, the hots for Juliet and, uh, and, and sort of holding a candle for her, I guess. And, and, and like maintaining a little bit of that rebellious, uh, nature, even as he is starting to become Bernard's shadow. And I was just thinking about how different this is in the show so far, but I could also see a scenario where they might, they might work their way to, uh, to this kind of, uh, this kind of relationship between the two of them. If for whatever reason, Bernard, takes more of a liking to to Lucas in the show than he's you know shown us so far he was sent to the mines in the show so like he would obviously have to like pull him out of the mines or something yeah you're right but but but, you know maybe maybe that'll be the start because we never see him actually in the mines we he he gets like sentenced so something could happen at the start of next season where he doesn't end up going or he could get pulled out of it for whatever reason yeah so um he he finds like her belongings after she's gone he like holds and it's like relics seemingly like watch and some other things and and then that right after that, Bernard like pulls him in and he's like, hey, I want you to come check this stuff out. And he's talking about possibly having him become a shadow. That's when he starts to bring him into this like hidden room with all this information, all these books on the walls and all this stuff. And he's like, I want you to start reading into kind of rebellions and stuff. Yeah, that, that there's a lot of there's a lot of world building <laughs> reveals here. A lot of the, you're talking about answers, right? And, and, and yeah. Bernard starts giving him answers and he's like, well, if you're going to be my shadow, you have to know. Um, but what's it, you know, the other thing I could see is there's been talk already of Sims being the shadow in the show. Um, so this might all end up coming to Sims and he could end up becoming a bit more of this Luke, like a version of this Lucas character. Although he wouldn't have this like thing where he's exactly. holding out for Juliet. So it might be a combination of multiple characters or something, but Sims was a lot more simple in the, in this book. Like all he was really just kind of the muscle for Bernard. He was out there like fighting people a lot, but like we don't see him, him a lot. He's not a very uh complex character in any way, I would say in the book. Yeah, and I wonder if it, like in the show if he has doubts about the whole situation and and maybe he doesn't need to have that relationship with Juliet to start to like plot yeah. with her as he's learning more information. Yeah, and come over to her like, side maybe. Yeah, and and well, so, I don't know. I, I still don't know if Sims is is that kind of guy or not. I think they've planted the seed with the family. Like he has yeah, that's like true. larger motivations than the silo. Um, so maybe, but we'll see. Yeah, maybe he'll become more disillusioned as he starts to learn some of these. So, some of the things we learn. Uh, some of the big reveals are that uh, Bernard sort of he's like he has this really interesting philosophy about it all where he's talking about like legacy versus history and like you know he like he does he disapproves of what happened before and yet he's like this is the world we live in this is what we are we have to do now and in order to survive and continue this um existence i have to be um sort of the arm of this of this movement of uh they destroyed the world is what the reveal is um the the it seems specifically america America. (laughs) yeah yeah seems Um, like america america was like on their way out 
and they were worried about losing their way of life. And so it seems like they just tried to destroy everybody in the world and um, set up these silos. And he describes it as like they wanted a more homogenous version of society to um, to survive the apocalypse. Um, unknown end date on how long you know the world's going to be going to be fucked like this, and and how long they're going to have to s- persist in these silos. Renard, you know, says that they're pieces of shit, and he would kill all of them if yeah. he was in the same room with them. So he clearly like he's like That's this is a fucked says, up scenario. But yeah, but then but then he's also like, but you know. That's what we're we, that's what we're saddled with. So we're just gonna keep it. We're gonna keep it up. It is interesting to think of like that that being such a such a poor motivation for him for him is in terms of like being that evil and and not necessarily like like something uh, that Howie did, but just that a character being that uh, sort of misled yep. into thinking like this is better than than a sort of like well, and um, Lucas is pushing back on it sometimes verbally, yeah. sometimes just in his own mind. He's like, oh, you mean the the sort of thing we're doing now because we are a part of this now you know he's right. like recognizing the role that they're playing in this uh ongoing uh scenario um and why so much secrecy and then he hears like oh some so, you know entire silos have failed in the past and so we're trying to avoid that from happening and like so there's all this excuses for why the oppression is in place and why everything is so tightly controlled um i i do think you know he's playing thematically with a lot of interesting real world things that you'll see happen and the whole idea of this like you know the people in the past are the ones who who created this system and they were fucking assholes they're terrible and yet i'm going to continue to perpetuate this system that's saying something about world politics in general right and how so many times you see some sort of you know system of governance or system of oppression that was put into place long before the people who are currently in power. And yet the momentum of that, they take up the mantle of it, even as they kind of act like they don't approve of it, but they're like, well, this is the system we've got now. Right. And, and I think he's saying something about that, about how like the trap is to, to just fall in line and say, I'm going to continue to perpetuate this. Yeah. And then the other interesting thing is, is as much as Bernard would have you believe that he's this like all controlling individual, he is under the thumb of some other being. Mysterious and, and, people yeah. that, that he talks to on the radio and, and seem to like, you know, approve or disapprove of his actions. We don't know much about that. There seems to be some sort of governance or controlling body for these silos. Because at one point, Lucas talks to them. And that's how, you know, he learned some of this information from this other mysterious character on the radio. One of the things that I was thinking about that that this story plays with as well is this idea that like our first thoughts of this is that they're being ca- contained and they're kept in there and that mystery kind of going along of uh, maybe it's amazing outside how dangerous that is if there is a revolution like the other silo that we see because that the, a revolution could spark up and people could think we're good to go outside, open the silo and kill everyone inside inside seemingly based on how, the conditions outside. So it's like there is a sense of they are kind of protecting just doing it in like a fascist like police state or something like well and part of the problem they're they're creating their own problem right because the problem is they're not being honest transparent yeah about a lot of the things that are going on so you create distrust and then when you create the distrust of course people are going to you know realize this so um well they have a whole rebellion playbook so they know that a rebellion is gonna they're like as soon as somebody doesn't clean we're fucked we're going to war yeah Uh, so and they, they, and they do go to war. That's the other thing that happens here is the uh, the mechanical rises up and, you know, uh, Walker and Knox, um, they sort of formulate this plan and then and Knox leads a group of these people up and then they meet up with, with someone from the mids and they basically wage war on the top, the up top um, part of, of the silo and it's bloody and there's bombs and there's guns. Everybody's armed. There's tons of guns. They may like, make their own guns um which i thought was a little i don't know it seems like that would be difficult uh, to do in a short amount of time they make a lot of weapons in general too not just guns like a lot of them have guns but they also like use their machinable know-how to make like other weapons and then a lot of bombs bombs. yeah dirty bombs and stuff yeah and then lucas is like on the front lines like shooting him like he has an assault rifle or something at one point and then he like he's like haunted by it later he's like thinking about how he was like killing them and stuff well, he was in the, the top, right? And I think they were pushing up into a, an area that he was at, and then and he, he was, takes like, up a gun and he it, ends yeah. up killing. But, but yeah, like you said, he's haunted by it. Yeah. I think he ends up killing Shirley's husband. Uh, that, may, that may be accurate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and then, um, yeah, but all of this flies by. This is like, uh, this is, I mean, there's like 80 chapters in this book, and this is like three chapters, right? Like, covers like all of this. Um, and they're pretty fast. Um, so I was kind of shocked by how quickly this uprising, like, comes up, happens, and then is sort of rebuffed. And then, and then what we're getting throughout the rest of the book is them sort of on the defensive. They've been driven back down. Um, and and sort of Sims is is leading the charge against them, and they're trying to trying to sort of wipe them out, and they're they're holding out. So the battle is like sort of ongoing, uh, yeah. and, and I think it's interesting the way that Howie kind of flashes back and forth between, uh, like so one chapter will be about like Juliet and the yeah. other Silo. Oh yeah, we got to talk. Guy. We got to talk more about yeah. Solo. So, and then the other the other chapter would be about like the the war, the battle, yeah. and everything that's going on. It's going back that. and forth. But speaking of back in seventeen. Um, she's exploring this empty silo, kind of, and she ends up encountering this guy Solo, um, and he's an interesting character. He's like one of the the new like major characters that we get a lot of, um, and he is he's been living here alone, but he's like haunted by these ghosts. He's like he he feels like there's like a, some sort of other presence, but like it seems like he's a little bit mad, and you don't know if he's imagining it or not. Um, and Juliet also continues to feel like someone's watching her and like, you know, so she feels like there's, there's another presence too, um, which was a sign for me, even at this yeah. point that there was going to yeah. be some other people here, um, you know, talking about things moving, you know, that they, they, you know, didn't, didn't move them themselves and it seems spooky and it's like, well, it's not ghosts. So there's somebody else here. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, Solo is an interesting guy. He's, he's, um, he's like a survivor of this rebellion that originally happened, and he's been living out his days here now by himself. Um, you know, it, yeah. I don't know. What did you think of him as a character? I thought it was cool because of the way the characterization is that he's like stuck as a teenager, even yeah. though he's like 40 something. Yeah, believe, he's never really progressed. And he d- hasn't had a lot of people to talk to. Yeah. And by that, I mean no one as Nobody, far as he yeah. knows. Talks and to himself a lot, it seems like. Yeah. So, so to have him and then the way that she talks to him some of the time and he's a little petulant at times, like he's almost like held on to this like teenage self. I thought that was a kind of a cool, interesting characterization for him. Um, yeah. He he also like I'm like the entire time I, I almost expected him to be playing an act or something like that, be part of a trap. But that's not ultimately what happens. We do yeah. get this extended sequence of diving. Yeah. Yeah. Which, so that's um, the, they they end up traveling down. And they find that the bottom levels of this silo have been flooded. But there's also the digging machine, which we saw in the show. That's actually underneath silo 17. Um, because we find out also that silo 18 is our primary silo. That's actually the name of So I was confused about that last time. I thought silo 18 was a, was a different, like a third silo. But that's actually the number of the current silo that the show is in and that the first book is in. So um, that that does make a, a bit of sense now. I just uh, got confused about that. So a few things. Yeah. So that that, you know, in the show, there's like a blinking like 18 sort of dongle. And I think it's they're just calling him and it's like his master key or something like that. Yeah. For that, that silo. That is, yeah. Um, but so so this is such a weird coincidence that tends to happen on the podcast is like you. uh so your dad and your and your sister, my my fiance Caitlin, um, they have been diving for a long time, and so and so I like literally like two or three weeks ago. I had no. I, we talked about how like in the silo, probably nobody knows how to swim. We talked about uh, in the show, like she she was scared to go down into the area that was flooded. Just uh, like we I've planned, we're planning a trip, and I wanted to get certified, so I took a bunch of uh, education <laughs> classes to do it. Uh-huh. I did my checkout. I did my checkout dives. Okay. Um. So I'm I'm open water certified now. I'm I'm a diver. And then okay. this extended diving sequence in this yeah. story happens. Was it and I was, was like, it was it harrowing? Or I mean, had, her, her hers was harrowing. Mine was, you know, I felt prepared and everything. Yeah, but I mean, it does, did it make yeah. you feel differently about it at it, all? It, or, no, yeah. it, no, it made me. It, it definitely brought up the idea. It is a dangerous thing to do. You're taking your life in your hands for sure. Yeah. And she she uh, uh, does, but she's doing it often often with like shoddy equipment. Yeah. And like stuff that she's cobbled together and she just doesn't, you know. Yeah, really, honestly, I, I really loved a lot of these parts and how um, thrilling they were and her trying to get air because her, her air supply cuts off like mid dive. Um, something happens to Solo. She doesn't know what. And like uh, it's kind of, she's kind of got like a diving bell situation is how, how it kind of works. Like she's just basically got a hose. Um, really interesting. I love the way it was written. Like I, 
I've I've mentioned this before. I, I I've I've written an underwater sci-fi novel that I'm querying literary agents with, and you know the idea of someone uh, struggling underwater is something that I've thought a lot about and written about. So um, I like the way he handled this, honestly. And there's a different point where she's like kind of chasing down these bubbles that look like quicksilver and or like a uh, liquid solder, I think she says, which makes sense because she's a mechanic. Um, I love the way that was described, and she's like chasing them down just to like get a little bit of air. Um, you know, and like kind of like losing her mind at different points and like thinking about how she wants to just take a big lung full of like water in and which is relatable as you learn to dive for sure. Because your, your, your instinct is of course your, your surface People breather. Panic. You're like, yeah. So you have to kind of, I, I didn't have like a total, uh, panic in any, in any sense, but like, as you're getting accustomed to being underwater, there is a, you kind of, you kind of do have to mentally work your way through that and say, I have an oxygen supply. I double checked it. Everything's fine. And kind of keep yourself down there. And the instinct is rip that thing out of your mouth and shoot to the surface which can be dangerous in different scenarios so yeah uh it, pretty pretty accurate i would say and for for that uh for that scene i again i think it's cool that she's continuing to use her machining know-how right like yeah. uh I, I love to see like how capable she is how much she is like able to navigate her way through this story because of her her history yeah. being a sheriff and being this this person who's working on the generator for yep. a long time and her parents uh, or her father's a doctor so she has, seems like she has a little bit of medical know how so she's well set up um, for a lot of this stuff but like I was interested by how much uh, communication is going on and how like um, there's these different radios and uh, back on the in our in silo eighteen Walker who's a man by the way I, I had some confusion about whether or not Walker existed in this book when we got to the show and I think that was why. Walker Walker being a man in the, in the book, I think I hadn't like realized that that was the same character, and I'm like, oh, okay, so this this is who that was. Um, but again, we also like we have a ton of characters, we don't spend as much time with them in the book. Um, but we see Walker here figures out a way to start picking up radio messages from all the other silos, and we learned there are 50 silos in total. Some of them have gone dark for for various reasons, but and sometimes we don't know. But um, all of a sudden, he starts hearing all these other messages, and it like opens up the world for them that there are these other silos. Um, so there's that going on. Then we have Lucas talking with the other silo on his radio, and then we have um, Juliet begins to talk to Lucas um, at at different times, like secretly, um, and and get updates about what's going on. Because he's locked. Let's talk a little bit more about that. He's locked in this room where he's supposed to be basically studying rebellion so that if it happens under his watch, but he's basically a prisoner in there currently, but being quote unquote trained to be a, his shadow, but he's in a room that has access to all information from the past as well. So he's, instead of reading only about rebellion, he's going and reading about a ton of other stuff, relaying that information to, to Juliet over the radio, communicating with her, which he's not, also not supposed to be doing. Um, and then the really interesting one is when we, when Lucas and Bernard are together and they're communicating with that sort of overlord figure of the silos, all the silos, and Lucas is there, they're like, well, congratulations on being appointed to possibly being one of the, the, you know, the rulers of the silo at some point. And he's like, do you have any questions for me? And Lucas asks him, how did all this happen? And it was just really interesting the way that all the characters, he, the, the person on the other end almost kind of laughed at him and was like, well, if you really want to know. And Bernard is like, I wouldn't have, want, I, I would kind of wish you didn't know that for a lot until you were much older. Um, but basically the idea is that what we talked about before America seemingly, uh, wanted to end the world. The world. And, and re yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the only other thing that I think is of note here is that Juliet at one point does speak directly to Bernard. <laughs> yeah. She's like, I'm coming for you. Like, you know, like you, you, your mistake was letting me live. And, um, yeah, they, they have a very, uh, antagonistic, uh, phone call with each other. It, it is fun. It is interesting how they play with the radios and like. I don't know how well, I don't know, defined this all is, but, like, it often just seems kind of plot convenient for, like, who can hear who at what times and when it is, like, a secret call you can have and not have other people listening in. Um, I was often wondering, maybe some of these are more, like, phone calls than radio. I, I was sometimes unc unclear about that. So maybe, like, when Lucas is talking to Juliet, they're actually on, like, a phone line. Um it was communications. They don't really understand how it works, so we don't really understand how it works in the show. Too, or in the yeah, I mean, it could just be different frequencies, yeah. um, obviously, and then Walker is able to tap into different, like, all the frequencies at some point yeah. because he just figures it out. I don't know. Okay, so let's get into the next part here, and then we can kind of move on to our final, our final judgments. So as Bernard becomes more and more unhappy with Lucas, he arranges for a way for Lucas to be sent out to clean. 
As Billings is taking Lucas upstairs to be sent out, Juliet has made contact with Bernard on the Silo System's radio. Billings listens to the two argue, believing that Lucas is about to be killed. Juliet makes herself a suit and a heat blanket to try and save him. The man in the Argon chamber, however, is not Lucas, but Bernard. After listening to Juliet and Bernard argue, Billings has decided that it was Bernard who committed the crimes against the Silo. Juliet is invited to be mayor of the Silo. She suggests a fresh start for the people with a community where people are told the truth and empowered instead of being manipulated. Okay, so let's go back. Um, I'm realizing that something gets skipped over in this summary, and that's her finding these other people, which end up being children, who are living in Silo 17. Um, They've attacked Solo, and she comes back up. He ends up living... Um, and then she encounters these children who um, I guess are the descendants of people and who have then had kids of their own. Um, kind of unclear their their entire history. I think we're going to get – we're definitely going to get more information on that in a future future story just because Imagine she so. ends up d- leaving that silo to head back over to silo 18, leaving yeah. the kids, leaving they're, Solo. They're, they're with Solo, but yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was – unclear about how the kids were able to stay out of sight on their own yeah and how there are only kids there when you know that means that only that means there were adults only a few years before that yeah to, in order i to mean have i guess maybe kids. they're there they're, she saw so many different bodies at different times maybe at some point in there the bodies were supposed there to were be the other survivors tried to leave i guess solo does say something about the fact that he's like he wasn't uh, always alone he wasn't always alone yeah and I think maybe that's some, some of the implication that there were some other people maybe who have who have since died. Um, yeah, it does seem like some of the the mysteries surrounding Silo Seventeen still haven't been fully explored, and everything that happened there. So I wonder if that's included in some of these other books. I, I imagine maybe maybe in the next ones we're we're getting some prequel stuff. We'll go back to what happened with Seventeen. That wouldn't surprise me. But yeah, it's it's pretty dark d- dark stuff. But um, you know, kind of a kind of a also heartwarming moment as Juliet warms to them and realizes that they're children. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's this young kid who has a, who has a, a baby herself. And, uh, there's an interesting part where Juliet's like, I didn't even know that you could do that because she's, you know, always had this implanted, um, uh, birth control, which was something that we had seen in the show. Um, and that was the first time we've really seen it explored in the same way here, I, I think. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, really some interesting stuff here. Um, and then this is all sort of, uh, put on hold when all of a sudden Lucas, gets sort of tricked. And this was reminiscent to me of a scene that happens in, in the first season of the show where Bernard is confronting Juliet and he's like, what did you just say? Did you just say you wanted to go out? Uh, it was kind of similar, but this was actually even more clever because it was it was literally Lucas who was asking to come out of this room he's in. He's been trapped in this room and Bernard kind of tricks him and he's I think he's got like a radio on so that Billings can hear it, right? Which ends up, you know, backfiring on him. He gets Lucas to say, like, yeah, I want to get I want to get out. <laughs> I want to get out of here. Yeah. And yeah. he's like, I can't believe you said it. You know, you, you know, <laughs> you, and so you have this moment of like, oh, shit, he's he's condemned himself. Now, this sets up, um, I think, one of the more controversial decisions here at the end, um, because you withhold some very important information from us in order to set up this sort of bait and switch reveal where Juliet thinks she's going to save Lucas um, and all of a sudden, it's Bernard. Which I thought the whole time was him. You know what I mean? During the sequence. It's weird because she's, she it sees seems his face. like she should have known sooner. She sees his she face sees and sees his, his surprise. Face. Like the surprise that he's there. Yeah. And she, or that she's there. Yeah. And she thinks that, that that's him. She she does the trek back from eight, from 17 to 18. Yeah. Um, she gets into the chamber just as they have Lucas, quote unquote, on the ground on his knees about yeah. to be like torched. And it and he's seems chosen, that he's chosen to burn yeah. himself. Yeah. He's chosen to burn rather than clean, which is apparently something that you can do. I didn't realize that. Or that. Um, yeah. But like some people have maybe done in the past, but like or they try and avoid it. I don't. I can't remember. She is able to get in there just in time. She had planned for this possibility with a, the heat blanket, it throws the heat blanket over both of them. Um, yeah. And then I was unclear on like how did this person? So should they like look each other in the face? There's a surprise reaction. How does she not happens. know it's not Lucas? She but also known. like how, why did he slip away and not be under the the? the so I think it makes blanket? some sense from the way it was described. It was like the blanket was a very imperfect heat shield. Mm-hmm. She had the superior heat tape, right? That we had, had been described. So her her suit was holding up better but even that was failing and she ends up getting pretty burned 
And she describes that at first he's holding in, but then at some point he starts to slip away. And she doesn't understand why, but she theorizes that it could be kind of a madness brought on by the pain of burning because she's like, it's getting in. It's not a perfect seal. And if his, you know, heat tape isn't right, which it seems like it wasn't, he's getting more burned. And so I think it's just supposed to be like a, a, you know, a fear response. I'm getting burned. I got to get away from here trying to escape. But of course, like the rest of the room is, is, is already. So it ends up being a more torturous, slow death for this character who we think is Lucas. Yeah. But then is revealed to be Bernard. And it's, it's just, it's an interesting series of events. I mean, it's surprising and, and, and like I can, I can give it points for that. But you kind of have to suspend disbelief a little bit that she didn't realize this wasn't Lucas in this moment where she sees his face. They um, do have, uh, you know, uh, big suits like on, <laughs> suits on and stuff with, I guess. with face masks and stuff. Yeah, yeah. so uh, unclear. But it seems to me like she sees him and she's like, "Oh, confirmed, it's Lucas." I you thought know, from so here too. POV. Yeah, I thought so too. But maybe just the assumption of the POV. And it's only in, when she's like POV. looking at the burnt body, which is like grossly like burnt up like different like the legs and the arms are just blackened and then all of a sudden she notices like a pot belly or something and then she's like oh this isn't lucas um um and then and then we we she ends up like collapsing because she's been burned at this point but um we don't know how badly and then we kind of get her just like waking up she's now in back in silo 18 and all and we're like what what's happened and she's like you know everybody's welcoming her and she's not arrested and killed she or has anything. her like frodo frodo when gandalf oh and the rest of the yeah. fellowship come in and they're like yeah. how are you yeah. yeah and peter billings so apparently was a key figure in you know turning on bernard and casting him out instead and we find out that bernard got sent out instead of lucas but this all happened off page so we didn't know any of this we only hear about it after the fact and peter billings is a character who my opinion was not developed nearly enough for this turn in the book. In the show, I think they're doing a great job with him potentially doing this. Um, I can totally see this being where we're leading, but we're setting it up meticulously by exploring this character in a way that the the, the book just doesn't. And so, I don't know. I was on the I was I was kind of mixed about this, and and it felt a little bit like unearned, um, even though the reveal was cool. Um, I, I I don't know. It felt a little convenient almost because we hadn't. We hadn't really explored Billings as a character. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. Um, and I think all, so does Hugh Howey, based on uh, his his uh, changing of probably, the, probably of the original story uh, yeah, for the realizing show. realizing that this needed to be shored up, probably. Yeah, yeah. None of this is like, you know, necessarily trying to say Huey did a bad job. It's just my personal, you know, sort of reaction to the, reading this part and going like, yeah, this, um, I don't know, it's not my favorite, not my favorite. Uh, sort of device here and it, it felt like purposely withholding this information because Lucas is a character whose POV we had had throughout so you are deliberately not showing us Lucas POV for all of this so that you can set up this reveal and I'm okay with that to an extent if the if the reveal is like oh that makes sense that this happened but I had I up to this point I don't feel like there had been enough groundwork laid for Billings to make this much of a change um, I, I, at least I hadn't seen it. It was maybe overly subtle. I don't know. I think, you know, you could, you can see that he's a, a justice, a figure for like real justice and all this stuff. And that maybe he would do that, but, but we just didn't know the character like that. Um, there's a lot of other characters that we were getting, uh, closer inspection on and, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the show. I'm sh confident that Billings is going to do a similar kind of thing here. Um, but just the fact that like Bernard was overcome by like basically his own, he was hoisted by his own petard. Yeah, it is a it is a fitting ending for him. I I, I can see this still playing out this way in the show and it being quite satisfying. Yeah, he could have uh, played it differently and been a little smarter about the way he went about it, but he got too dictator. He got too egomaniacal. He believed everything. He thought he was the god king, and he uh, sort of ran with it, and then uh, that, that sort of backfired on him at some point when yeah. he, all his underlings weren't just going to go along with whatever he said. Yeah. There was this whole part where it seemed like the people down in the, the lower levels were going to, like, kill all of the IT people with, like, exhaust, and exhaust up into it, and Juliet is, like, trying to talk them out of it. Um, but yeah, it doesn't end up working that way. Um, and they end up, I guess, being able to stop it. Lucas at one point even says that he smells smoke or something like that. And Bernard comes up and he's like, no, it's just the server room. That's what it smells like. And I'm like, oh shit, like it's going to go down. And then it doesn't, I guess, I think it's because she calls them off. Um, yeah, but they weren't listening way. to her. I was a little unclear as to why this didn't end up happening. Again, we were flying 
at the end here. It felt like everything was happening so fast. And we would jump we would jump to like the next part and like I'd be like, "Well, whatever happened with that thing?" <laughs> yeah. If you if you haven't read the story, I think around chapter like 78 is when she is literally leaving Silo 17 to go to Silo 18 and there's only 83 chapters or something like that, 84 chapters. And so like in the course of like f- four or five chapters, she gets back over there. They like she she saves Lucas, they wrap up the story, which she ultimately ends up being like the new mayor yeah. or, or like yeah. elected so the, as the new so, mayor. So Lucas is there, like you said, like kind of the Frodo moment. He, she, he's been, been there sort of like while she's recovering. And then he's like, hey, you know, big news. <laughs> We're having another election and uh, you're going to run. You know, you're going to you're going to you're going to be our leader. Um, and she ends up winning and be, be sort of nominated mayor. Um, and then they have like they have their first kiss. Um, oh, also. At one point, Lucas has learned about the existence of George and that they had previously had a relationship. And like so much of the George stuff from the show is not even in the book like this. Like we get very little of their relationship. And and, and um, I thought it was a really interesting way that they approached that, that whole relationship in the show. It was much more defined and, and, and moving, honestly. And, um, you know, Lucas gets like weirdly jealous about it <laughs> again. I'm like, why are you being so jealous? Like. You know, he, he's he's very possessive of, of her all of a sudden when he, like, has doesn't yeah. really know her that well. He doesn't know her, yeah. He's yeah. just had con- conversations with her uh, over the phone, over their, like, radio. But Who's this guy uh, that she uh, once liked? Yeah, was he in, like, a childhood uh, crush or something like that? You're like, doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> yeah. Bigger, bigger things to, at play right now. He's, like, learning about the, the secrets of the world. The guy's dead anyway. He's like, oh, I'm, I hate this guy. And he's like, well, he's dead anyway. It's like, all right, dude. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Lucas was like, honestly, I feel like they've made Lucas more likable in the show so far. Like, even though he is still like, you know, done some questionable things, but like this version of Lucas, I wasn't as fond of, honestly. Um, I think that you know, you mentioning that the next book is a prequel is really interesting because I'm like, what does that look like? Is it prequel for Juliet? Is it prequel for like 100 years ago, the first rebellion, all that kind of stuff? Like, uh, I'm curious, but I would assume or guess that maybe some of the George stuff. Uh, and some of this other stuff that was left out of the of this book that we see in the show might show up. There are, I think, there are once again kind of three parts to it. I was reading, um, but from from what I was seeing, is it might be like a lot longer before the events of this, where I wouldn't think George would even be alive yet. Um, but again, I didn't want to get too deep into it in case we end up, re- you know, coming back to this at some point for another season. And like, you know, would we would we what will we read? And you know, I don't want to get I don't want to spoil myself. Um, so I didn't look too into it, but they, you know, as I said, they kiss and she, uh, you know, she seems like she's going to be mayor and she's like, I'm going to lead with truth and we're going to reform society. And this whole thing kind of ended on this like surprisingly optimistic note, um, that I, I was a little surprised that we got there. Cause I'm like, there are still all these other silos and we don't know how they feel about this happening. Um, and so obviously that's where we're going to return to in a future book. Um, cause like, it seems like there, you know, this isn't the bow that it seems to be. Um, but uh, you know, maybe there was, he, he was thinking like, I'm going to, I'm going to try to wrap this story uh, for, for the moment, you know, for the time being. And, and he does. Yeah. I, I think that's what it was. I, I think it was uh, a close out this story, have it have like that, that ending that we need and then move into the next story where he clearly, he wanted to go back and flesh out some of the other stuff that's going on previous. And like, maybe that's probably going to honestly lead us into some of the stuff that we don't know about with the overarching organization stuff. I bet you that prequel would sort of show more of that. And then, you know, we'd then come back to Juliet. I can also see readers finding that to be more difficult when you get so attached to like a character like Juliet. If you just have the next book be entirely without, it reminds me of speaking of George R. R. Martin earlier in the episode, it, how, um, you know, Dance of Dragons and Feast for Crows were like yeah. half like half of the POVs the and half the characters. And yeah. you're like, all right, I'm reading this <laughs> totally entire true. book without John and Danny right now. Here I go. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I will be curious when we get in, when we get into future books to see how that how that uh, went over with the fan base. But um, I mean, let us know in the comments if you're on this one. Um, but I, uh, we are reading leading up to the end here. I think the only other thing was there was this epilogue chapter. Yeah. Um, where uh, it was Solo back in Silo 17 with this uh, one of the kids that was saved, um, whose name, I think the name is Elise, and they uh, the water is draining, um, and it, it's a very short sequence, but um, it's, an, again, another optimistic sequence where it's like, ooh, the water's draining, 
things are changing in 17. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah. I think, again, that that must be explored later. Yeah, it must be. So anyway, um, it's now the end of the coverage. <laughs> We've reached the end. We finished out the book. We have the show. Um, let's make our comparisons. Uh, do you want to start? Or do you want me to? Sure, I'll start. Um I think this is a, such an interesting project for us because one going in, we talked about how like we didn't realize that the first half of the book was the entire show. So that kind of caused us to shift our coverage in comparing them. You almost have to only compare the first half of the book and the show because that's the relevant material that yeah, kind of overlaps kinda true, yeah. with some with some of the secondary. But I will try to bring in some of like the full story. Nature it is a book of, being sold as a book, right? It's uh, so I think it is also fair to bring in some of what we read here today. I'm definitely doing that. And I think getting some of those answers because it's just what a cliffhanger that show was for me and what a cliffhanger the sec the first half of that book is where you're like and Juliet, our character that we followed, she goes out and who knows and she she's able to survive it seems now what um and i really liked how the book presented the different povs like in the different parts early on and i was like man this is so smart it's very cool and each each one's like i felt like holston got his whole story yeah like, that felt satisfying to me i felt mary john's got her whole story that yeah, felt Mars, completed yeah. to me and then it took all three of these other parts to get Juliet's full story here. And I would argue that her story is not even over yet. So I do think that like the first part of the book, first maybe half of the book is is stronger for me. And then we move into the stuff that was big reveals, which I loved getting. Um, the world, it, it, it's really fascinating. Great world building in terms of like adding the other silos, all these mysteries being revealed near the end. I think he's really good at, at handling his mysteries, how he is. Um, but the show, again, I think I've already set this up earlier in the episode, so I'll keep it pretty brief. It's Howie getting to, having written this entire series and knowing where all of the three different books with all those different parts go, getting to recontextualize all of it in one cohesive narrative. Um, and I think that the show so far feels really focused in that way and the performances are so strong and the world feels really lived in. That like to me, I just I'm, I'm so much more pulled and mo more fascinated by the show right now. Yeah. Um, and I'm willing to like as later books come out, I'm willing to, to reevaluate if I like this, the book series or the, or the show more. Right now, it's the show for me. Yeah. I mean, it's the caveat we always have to give like the show wouldn't exist without the book. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, this is the origin of it. And then, yeah, you got this is a unique scenario where you have Hugh Howie so heavily involved in the show as well. Um, and it seems like he is taking another swing at this and, and developing things a little more. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I honestly think the show is the superior version of this one. Um, you know, granted, you know, the origin and all the things, you know, that, that I just said, but, um, yeah, I, I got to take the show here. I think it's exploring the characters more, th more thoroughly, exploring the world more thoroughly and carefully. Um, the place, the, the pace is slowed down, but you know, Credit to Howie. This is like the definition of like a high concept novel. Um, it's something that gets talked about a lot. Like people say, oh, I want a high concept. It's like, this is a high concept for sure. You know, it's what if society lived in the silo and like it's a post apocalypse. And um, he, t he takes it from there and it's it's well done, um, you know, having, having a ton of success with it. So, you know, you know, I continue to be uh, impressed with the man. Um, I think that this, this is quite the achievement. And, um, you know, th there's nothing... It seem, really seems like being so heavily involved with the show, it's like that's all a piece of it now. You know, it's not it's not as separate as sometimes adaptations can be um, from the creator. Um, so, yeah, I'll take the show, too. And we are a bit TBD on the show uh, because that season two is coming out. We'll see if that, that maintains the sort of quality level that we've been experiencing so far. So uh, jury's still out like on the whole series. But as as far as the first season goes... Um, and the first book, I think we're we're in agreement here. Yeah. Okay. So at the very end of the episode, we're going to announce what our next project is. It was voted on by the patrons. Uh, but in the meantime, if you enjoyed our coverage, let us know in, in a comment if you're on YouTube uh, and like the video. That tends to help us out in the algorithm there. And then if you are on audio, uh, thank you for listening and leave us a rating and review. Shout out this coverage in particular if you enjoyed it. Um, we'd love to hear from you that way. And also be sure to connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those at Ink to Film. We're also on TikTok, Blue Sky. If you're on a social media platform, we're probably on there as well. So, so <laughs> check us out. That's true. And as mentioned before, we do have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Ink to Film. If you wanted to support us monetarily, uh, that's where you're going to do it. And you get all kinds of bonus episodes on there. In fact, uh, speaking of that underwater sci-fi novel of that, you know, 
piques your interest. Um, I've been talking about my journey trying to get a, a literary agent, well, a new literary agent. I had one previously um, for this book and uh, where I'm at with that. And I give some updates in our most recent Query Quest episode, which is uh, what's out on Patreon now. So we'd love to have you over there, patreon.com slash inkedfilm. And thank you to Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. All that's left to do is to announce what our uh, Patreon selection was for our quarterly poll. It's our third project of the year selected purely by patrons. Um, and I'm really excited to announce that A Knight's Tale is what won, um, which is one that like, I think for a long time, I did not realize was an adaptation at all. Um, oh, I didn't either. Yeah. But, but turns out it's adapted, I think from a Chaucer poem. Um, and I'm sure, you know, <laughs> very different, but uh, we're going to get into it. You know, that's what was voted on. And honestly, I'm like so excited that this won because Something about like the Ren Fair feel of it. I don't know. The fall is here. I'm just like, it feels like it's the right time. Um, I'm excited to revisit this movie. I haven't seen in years. Um, I remember enjoying, but like, I, I remember, I just think about the cast that's in this and I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, I can't believe it. So um, I'm excited for this one, man. It's a fun movie. I, uh, that, that blend of like fantasy with, with, the comedy oh, and yeah. the, like modern music modern like music, so much yeah. about it like it's such oh a man, unique so movie cool. it'd be fun to talk about it should be really fun uh very very you know a big change of pace from what we've been doing here with silo so i'm excited for that looking forward to it and that'll be next so uh make sure to stick around for that in the future uh but that's uh that's gonna be it for silo so until next time keep adapting keep adapting